Hi guys, welcome to lecture nine of our semester, our third online lecture and our last uh, formally, formal lecture of the year. Um, in place of a lecture next week, there will just be an online um, live discussion over Canvas um, to review for the exam on April 15th. So uh, in this class we'll talk about an issue in bioethics. Uh, is brain death the death of a human person? You know, our year so far has been more or less building up the theoretical groundwork in order to, uh, uh, of the human person, in order to arrive at this sort of, j just such a practical application as this. And now, our year has discussed sort of, if, if, if there was one central theme, there, it, it's of the, the utter coherence and um, integrity of the human person that which is incommunicable and can't be reduced to a closed definition. And we've talked about the human as, you know, not just this or that thing, but as a wholeness of it, will, of intellect, of heart, of subjectivity. Um, we've talked about how we know persons. We know them intersubjectively. We know them by encounter. Um, we, we, we know them really, not notionally. If we if we'll if we were to draw on um, Newman's terms from earlier in the year, um, and just last week we talked about the the mind body union that first union of body and soul that can't be um, that can't be severed, but unnaturally right in death, and and so we've talked about all these sort of things and that central theme of of the utter coherence of the of a union of a of a wholeness or fullness in the human person um, that can't be reduced and can only be known through encounter. Okay. And now today those themes will more or less trickle into our discussion on this very practical issue of, of brain death that, uh, that we encounter in instances of organ donation, for example, that's the big one, um, or comas or, or what have you. So, so, Having said that, let, let us enter let us enter the text. So this is by Robert Spayman, who is a German philosopher. He is um, he hasn't really been known in the Anglophone world until recently. He is, his work has only just started to be translated in the last uh, decade or two, and in that time he has made quite a mark and an impact in philosophy, in ethics, and uh, perhaps most essentially in, in the philosophy of the human person. And now the only reason we haven't really encountered him yet, yet this semester is because his writing is very dense, I think, for an introductory level. Um, but this, very luckily, is a, is a quite accessible text, I think. And I think that is the case because he was trying to make sure that this could be read by... Um, philosophers and medical professionals and laymen, interested people alike, um, because it's a very practical matter uh, of, of ethical conduct. So he starts the text, um, Spayman opens by stating that life and death are not primarily objects of science. Our primary access to the phenomena, phenomenon of life is self-awareness and the perception of other humans and other living beings. In other words, we know what life is, and that life is, not through a scientific lens of study, but through its encounter and personal experience. So this is just simply to say that life is not, maybe somewhat ironically enough, uh, a theme of study in biology, let's say, biologos, which is called the study of life. They might study how life works, how it exists, but not uh, the why the what for, etc. Um, Spayman quotes Aristotle, life is the being of the living. Therefore, for the living being, the cessation of life is the cessation of being or existence. We know life, therefore, by its being, by its existence, by the encounter we have with it. Natural science cannot define this event in the way in which we experience it. So again, we... Um, the life that natural science studies is not, it does not study the why of life. Why does it exist? 
Why do we have life? Um, what is this thing we encounter in other people that we call life? Right? It rather studies how, its functions, its operations. So despite the fact that biology calls itself the study of life, it takes up the how side of the question, not the why. Thus, just like themes such as being or existence, or form, soul, person, etc., the theme of life is outside of science's purview. Now, we would ask, whose purview is it in, if it isn't in sciences? And, and we would say, well, in the philosophers, or in anybody, right, who, who's ever encountered it before. It, it's not um, a specialized topic that you necessarily have to go to school for 12 years and get an MD um, or equivalent to understand. So for Spayman, then, life has the mysterious quality of an internal unity that can't be reduced to anything less than it is. Like the human person, we witness a unity, a wholeness, indivisible to its parts. In a sense, what we encounter when we encounter life is an already extraordinary simplicity that we distort when we attempt to put it into simpler terms. And this is all just to say that, you know, we don't, we know life best in that perception of it that we encounter, that internal unity, that wholeness that animates a being, right, that gives it life before we give it some sort of scientific description, right? Those scientific descriptions or even bad philosophical descriptions will reduce that first perception, that first integral unity that we see um, if we seek to give it some sort of simpler understanding, right? So, for example, if we talk about this in the theme of the person, right, for many, it's simpler to have a definition of the person because it, it appeases our, our satisfy, satisfy our, it, it appeases our desire to have uh, easy explanations, right? So to say the person is, is the animal that reasons, right, um, or the animal that has memory, or the animal that has physical abilities, uh, has a certain kind of physical ability. These are easy definitions, and they make life simple for us, but they're very problematic, because these, these definitions that make life easy for us, that we can easily understand and hang on to and put in our back pocket, reduce the human person, are very dangerous definitions to have, because if we don't fit into reason, if we don't fit into memory, if we don't fit into a certain set of physical abilities, of course, then we fall outside the margins of what a person is, right? Um, so, so, so life. Life is this first simple integral unity that we encounter in animate beings. Unlike the unity of atom or molecule, the unity of the living organism is constituted by an anti-entropic process of integration. Death is the end of this integration. So to rephrase this, life itself is an internal unity, doesn't decompose as objects do. This internal uni in, in unity is there in us until the second it is gone, right? At which point, death comes into the picture. Um, so what does this mean? Life doesn't decompose. Well, it's not like an organ. It's not like a part of the body that withers away, right? Life is life. Life is integra integrally unified in the animate being until it's gone, right? You can't be, life can't be half itself or a quarter of itself. Either it is or it isn't. You can't be pregnant. You can't be half pregnant, right? You're either pregnant or you're not pregnant, right? So in this case, in the way we're talking about it, you either have life or you don't. There's no middle degree. Um, there's a weakening life, there's a stronger, st stronger life force, we could say, but that unity, that integral unity, is there until it's gone. Whoosh, disappeared. So with death, the reign of entropy begins, right? Entropy being sort of chaos, de de decomposition. Hence the reign of destructuring, of decay, right? So to say an organism is, a living organism is constituted by an anti-entropic process of integration is to say, it's a, a structuring process, right? Um, it's a living internal unified system. 
We cannot define life and death because we cannot define being, or full indivisible unity, or death, complete absence. So there are th some things that we can't define, right? Again, those things that we encounter first, that we perceive before we give that sort of description that can take away that first sort of extraordinary simplicity that we encounter. Um, we can, however, discern life and death by means of their physical signs. So Spayman notes that breath has traditionally been identified with life itself for being the basic phenomenon of life. And in the ancient world, in, in Latin, it was spiritus. In Greek, it was pneuma. These, these words meant both spirit and they both meant breath, right? Um, they were interchangeable. The cessation of breathing and heartbeat, the dimming of the eyes, rigor mortis, etc., are the criteria which, since time immemorial, humans have been have seen and felt that a fellow human being is dead. So in other words, we discern death by discerning the absence of life, not because we have any available definition of death via scientific explanation. Right? So we've never had some sort of scientific biological description of what life is, nor have we had one of what death is. Rather, death is the absence of life, right? And life is some kind of wholeness, integral unity in the animate being. There is no definitions uh, we can put up, put around these things, other than that um, first extraordinary simplicity, as I've been calling it. So this incapacitation of perception fortunately did not last. This is the Cartesian one. It is returning today in a different shape, however namely by the introduction of a new definition of death, or rather the introduction of a definition of death in the first place, in order to be able to declare a human being dead sooner. Importantly, we've never actually defined death, right? Again, it's just been the absence of life. Again, says it, states Spayman, this is akin to changing the definition of pain from the experience of pain to pain's neurological infrastructure, so that medical observation could determine anyone claiming to be experiencing pain as potentially in no pain at all, which happens a lot, right? And this is the idea that, you know, science makes a definition of pain as a certain, say, neurological process in the terms of last week's discussion, let's say C-fiber firing. And now if you are in pain and you don't match that scientific description, then ergo you don't you aren't actually in pain right and now how often do we begin at this sort of um at, 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 in this position right we we judge things first from an ideo ideology right an ideological structure and we don't let anything in the door that doesn't actually suit the definitions we've already created it's it's much more coherent philosophically to begin with that phenomenal experience of pain right it would seem that someone is experiencing pain. Now, if that doesn't suit our scientific definitions, or at least the ones we've laid out so far, perhaps we actually have to reassess our science, not, not cast doubt upon anyone who doesn't fit into this, this very narrow definition, right? So, <clears throat> so this is essentially doing the same with death. We're changing death to a different definition, right? Um, just as one would with pain in this case. So that if we are, um, so that science sets the terms, essentially, ideologically, for what death is, not humans anymore, or not humans in their own um, normal experience. So is, is brain death what all mean when they say death? Now this is a interest. This, this is a sort of an aside, but this is an interesting way that um, Spayman has formulated the question because it it's 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 much in the tradition of how Thomas Aquinas and other theologians used to form questions. Now F Thomas Aquinas wasn't a personalist philosopher. He wasn't a phenomenologist. These things didn't exist as schools of thought in his time. But he began with, he began with a certain um, trust in a sort of universal personal experience. Um, so for example, Aquinas wouldn't, um, you know, he doesn't ask, 
is it possible for us to say God is good? Is it possible to say God is beautiful? Is it possible to say God is love, wisdom, etc.? Rather, he asked the question, it would seem that most people tend to call God things like love, goodness, beauty. Now, in that it seems that all people tend to do this, what, what might those mean? What might these terms mean to us? Right? So, so this isn't, um, so this is sort of beginning with a, a trust in that universal personal experience, um, that datum of personal experience, as we'll call it later. Um, and you begin there. Here, similarly, we begin with what, 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 what do all people say death is? What would it seem that we all say death is? What is this universal experience, this universal way we all have of seeing death? And why doesn't brain death fit into that picture? Why does brain death seem to betray um, that, that, that first sort of intuition of what humans say death is? So is brain death what all mean men is what all mean when they say death? Not according to the Harvard Commission of 1968. The definition of death was changed, Spaven argues, not with the interests of the dying in mind, i.e. being declared dead prematurely, but for the sake of third-party interests. For this, he gives two reasons. One, guaranteeing legal immunity for disc discontinuing life-prolonging measures um, that would constitute financial and personal burden for family members and society alike. And two, collecting vital organs for the purpose of saving the lives of other human beings through transplantation. So these two interests are not the patient's interests, since they aim at eliminating him as subject of his own interests as soon as possible. Now, of course, just because this definition of death might work to the benefit of other people and not the dying doesn't in, self, in itself disqualify such a definition. If it is to be disqualified, it must be disqualified because of the definition's lack of inner coherence. Right? However, we ought to be wary of definitions of death produced by, for instance, transplantation <laughs> physicians, right? Such as those that drew up the Harvard Medical School Declaration. So again, just to rephrase, we, it, it, when we're cynical of a uh, definition because it might benefit others to create that definition, whether it's financially or otherwise, um, this in itself doesn't mean that that definition is untrue, right? But it does mean we ought to be, of course, <laughs> well, cynical of it, um, and highly so. Likewise, it is in the moral interest of transplantation physicians to have little to do with the formulation of these criteria of death, so as not to appear in a conflict of interest, right? It, they're beholden to a certain integrity. For where, where would personal integrity lie in a profession that served its own interest rather than in those whose interest it claimed to serve? It has to be ensured that live, save, saving lives does not happen at the expense of the lives of other people. The Harvard consensus switched the definition of death from cardiac death to brain death, right? So this is a, this is a var, vital flip. While this new definition has not been consolidated and has many opponents and scientists, researchers, neurologists among them, not just philosophers or conservative Catholic or, I don't know, Jehovah Witnesses, whoever it might be, very, very typical people uh, take, um, take issue with this. Despite that, it has managed to become normative and argues now from a position of strength and authority. It has no philosophical facts on its side, or strong arguments, we should say there, but argues rather from the normative, normative power of the factual. So this isn't necessarily factual in itself, but it's, it's something that becomes so normative, it's like a fact, right? So it becomes an established medical practice, or it becomes an institutional routine. Spayman would thus like to make his own argument against this new definition of death. What this consensus defines as death is not what all mean when they say death, okay? So, enter philosophy here. So, proponents of 
of new de- of of this new definition that the Harvard um, Medical School has has come up with falls into two subgroups. The first subgroup distinguishes between the life of the human being and human life, i.e., the life of a person or what they call a person, and that their understanding of personhood is problematic. Um, According to this group, the term human life should only be used as long as mental processes of a specifically human nature can be discerned. When the organic basis of such processes cease to exist, the human being is no longer a person. Okay, so we've encountered this, um, this, this idea before when we talked about Peter Singer. This might not have, this might have been uh, the first class um, that we had where we spoke of Peter Singer, who is this um, Australian bioethicist who um, who believes that uh, the human person is 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 not sort of affixed to his biological components in a way. but a, a, a living human being can be a person and then not be a person depending on mental processes. So the loss of cognitive function, for example, that, that area in our minds where, where we can reason, let's say, where we, where we hold memory, where we store memory, etc. Um, once we lose this cognitive function for bioethicists, um, very mainstream ones, I should say, he's not in some sort of extreme camp. Um, he does TED Talks, etc. For a guy like Peter Singer, you are no longer a person, even if you're a living human being. You're no longer a person once um, once this cognitive function sort of uh, uh, departs. Now, the second subgroup claims to claims death to occur once the human organism as a whole ceases to exist. The idea here is that there is an integration process co- constituting the unity of the organism, and when this unified integration stops, so does human life. So the presupposition for this group is that the brain is the organ of integration. Subtract the brain, therefore, and you subtract the integral integral unity that is the life of the human. So we'll get into this more, but the brain for these folks... So for, so for them, um, human life, as we understand it, stops once they're, this process of integration breaks down. Now, as we said before, um, life either exists or it doesn't, right? You can't be half pregnant, right? There's, it, it, it's either a unity in the person, this animation of a living being, of, of a being, um, or it isn't, right? Now, now, people in this argument would say that the brain is this sort of integra- the, the, the modulatory integrating um, organ. And once that sort of goes offline, then there's nothing we could call an integral unity anymore. So there's no life. Um, so the first group, and this is the, the Peter Singer type, um, Peter Singer types, the first group runs counter to medical orthodoxy, Spayman argues. Were we to assume persons were no longer persons once the processes of a specifically human nature shut down, there would be many patients in the hospital finding themselves on an early trip to the morgue. And yeah, no, so it, this, so what Spayman is saying is that, that this Peter Singer type argument wouldn't only impact people who have been diagnosed with brain death, but rather would imp- impact those who, who, who don't fit a certain set of, men- set of mental processes and mental abilities that equip us to be a person. You know, um, so it would depend on how we're defining those, but Peter Singer would say it would be cognitive activity in the brain. So once our reasoning sort of uh, centers of the brain break down, our memory storing centers of the brain break down, not only would people who are brain death be considered no longer persons, but arguably so would people in those dementia, dementia units or those in mental health units. Again, depending which mental processes we, we'd like to define as person-worthy or person-granting. Um, so, so a very big problem there that medical orthodoxy recognizes. So medical orthodoxy, 
would not narrow its definition to something as um, something as refined, I guess, as Peter Singer's argument attempts, um, because they know this would be problematic in many ways. Not only would people get and probably wouldn't get sent to the morgue, but but if persons were no longer considered persons, you know, then you know who's to say what sort of quarter sort of tests we could run on them. It'd be very World War II like Nazi Nazi doctors doing experiments on Jews who were subpersons based on their own definitions of personhood. So it would get us into a whole bioethical jam of uh, in this way. Now the second group asserts in a hypothesis that the brain is the organ of integration in human life. But since life would appear to remain at brain death, what is our claim? What is this illusory life we still observe? The untenability of this assertion, that the cessation of the brain is the cessation of life, forces the second subgroup to move closer to the position of the first, that death occurs when the semblance of a specifically human nature shuts, shuts down. So, so I think, I think Spain was, was speaking of a conference he was at in, in this essay, where where when pressed, a lot of the people who populated the second group, when pressed, would concede that their argument doesn't make much sense, that there still seems to be a sort of integral unity of life going on in this person, even after brain death. Um, and so when pressed, they would usually take up the line of the first group's argument, like, okay, well, yeah, you're right, you're right, there's still life, but come on, they're not, they're not human persons anymore. They've they're, they they don't you know um, they're not evincing a specific specifically human nature as we all understand it right um, now now of course they're just taking up the position of the first because the question is what constitutes personhood what are we talking about when we talk about a specifically human nature um, so one problem Brayman notes. Uh, in any or all of these, is, is one problem with identifying brain death as the death of the person is, well, simply perception, right? Spayman again mentions the analogy of the obviously observed pain in animals that a rigid Cartesian science once refused to see, as we, we, as we have already spoken about. He also lists anecdotal, anecdotal examples, a testimony from a neurologist who refuses to diagnose death based on neurological, i.e. brain, criteria and a general observation that nurses in transplantation units are prepared neither to donate their own organs nor to receive donated organs. What they see on a daily basis, basis makes it impossible for them to become part of this practice themselves. So nurses basically, I mean, again, we, 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 we can't just place our entire argument on anecdotal evidence, but, but, but essentially what, what this anecdotal evidence communicates is probably what many of us don't get to see because we don't work in hospitals or environments around those who have brain death, right? Um, and what, so all we have is testimony. So what we can know is that it would seem that people who are, have been diagnosed with brain death do perhaps more than merely breathe or have a heartbeat or, or twitch. Given the, the nurse's testimonies, they might do more, right? You know, uh, make noises, move their arms, their limbs. I think uh, Spayman talks about one woman grabbing his, one, one, one person grabbing the nurse's arm, um, which requires a compl complicated coordination of motor function, right? Um, so what else do they see? Well, perhaps some of the more nightmarish um, scenarios we can we can dream up right girl woke up from a coma as doctors were removing organs for donation what 19 year old Karina Melchior was declared brain dead and was about to have her life support turned off by doctors following a horrific car accident but to the shock of staff at the Aarhus hospital in Denmark Karina suddenly opened her eyes and moved her legs just as they were about to harvest the girl's vital organs my goodness now oh, I'm I sort of laughed there, but this, this of course, is, is, is the nightmare scenario. So but whether a person wakes up or not, we might still say in response to any appearance of life, 
a body capable of vegetative responses requiring complicated coordination of muscle activity is obviously not in that state of dense integration which would entitle us to say that it is not alive, i.e. that it does not exist anymore. So here Spayman states, the reasons of common sense converge with those advanced by medical science. Namely, that if we do not equate the cessation of the heartbeat with the destruction of the heart, or the cessation of breathing with the death of the lungs, why do we assume it in the case of the brain? Do we not resuscitate the former organs? The cessation of heart and lungs is reversible. Reversible. Why not the brains? Why would we not consider the brain's death, we could say, as re re reversible? It would almost seem as though, I mean, in, the, in that latter case, in the hospital where the girl woke up, it would seem that it was the case. But here, here we might be moving towards that more cynical part of our argument again, where it would seem that, you know, given the pressure doctors are under to donate organs and the people who need organs, we can often, when, right when someone goes into brain death, we can sort of may perhaps get ahead of ourselves and realize that we have a limited window here to get these organs um, to somebody so that brain death is sort of overlooked as something that is indeed reversible, just like uh, just like cardiac arrest or when one starts stops breathing. I mean, that's precisely why we do CPR is to get those things up and going again. So, <clears throat> um, moreover, for many brain death, for many brain death does not mean the total loss of brain function. There remains still some peripheral brain function. This peripheral function is understood as distinct from the integrative function of the brain. However, and that no one can quite prove what this integrative function is, how can we then say what is peripheral? In other words, how can we justifiably say where the margins of the peripheral life begin if we can't determine what it is that would determine those margins, right? So you can't have margins, you know, you can't have a periphery if you don't know what the center is off of which that periphery, you know, is attached, right? Um, so if we don't know what the main thing is, then we don't know where the periphery begins, and if we can even call it a periphery, right? Um, perhaps what we're calling periphery has something to do with very central processes to, um, to the being of the human person. We don't know. Um, Paul Byrne, there is no limit to what real functions may be declared peripheral when the only non-peripheral function is imaginary. Right. So is it justified to call the somatically integrative function of the brain imaginary? The word somatic, is, uh, of course, is, is, uh, refers to the body, right? So that integrative function of the brain as, as, you, as um, integral to the, to the unified life of the body, etc. Um, to answer this question, Speyman replies upon the research of Alan Schumann. Key points, I think I say Schumann and Schumann a lot, but I think the real spelling is Schumann, so excuse, excuse me where I drop that M. Um, to answer this question, Speyman relies upon the research of Alan Schumann. Key points from the abstract of this research are as follows. Sherman argues that the brain does not confer integrative unity on the body transforming it from a mere collection of organs and tissues to an organism as a whole. Most integrative functions of the brain are not somatically integrating, and conversely, most integrative functions of the body are not brain-mediated. With respect to organism-level vitality, the brain's role is more modulatory than constitutive. Integrative unity of a complex organism is an inherently non-localizable holistic feature involving the mutual interaction among all the parts, not a top-down coordination imposed by one part upon a passive multiplicity of other parts. Right? So they all work together. They all re require each other. This is part of the philosophy of systems theory. Right? That that all the parts. I, I mean. And when we talk about the wholeness of a person, all the parts correspond, right? There's no main main part of the person or else we could define the person by that part, right? There's a whole system at work, a whole irreducible system that can't be pinpointed or located in some um, 
positivist way, I think we could say. Finally, Schumann states, what is of the essence of integrative unity? And I say, I think Schumann is a, um, oh, I forget what he is. He, is he, I think he's a, a medical researcher. Um, so, and, and that his words have carried much weight in the argument uh, uh, over brain death. So he's a, he's a vital authority on the matter to be listening to in this field. What is of the essence of integrative unity is neither localized nor replaceable namely the anti-entropic mutual interaction of all the cells and tissues of the body mediated in mammals by circulating oxygenated blood. To assert this non-encephalic, -encep that means uh, related to the brain, essence of organism life is far from a regression to the simplistic traditional cardiopulmonary criterion or to an ancient cardiocentric notion of vitality. If anything, the idea that the non-brain is a mere collection of organs is a bag of skin, a.k.a. meat sack, if you remember our video, seems to entail a throwback to a primitive atomism that should find no place in the dynamic systems-enlightened biology of the 90s and 21st century. So an, an atomic view, an atomist view, would be to say, of course, that one thing defines the whole. One thing keeps it all together. That a person, for example, to use that analogy again, can be reduced to some atomic part of himself, his legs, his shoes, I don't know, his eyes, his, his brain, whatever it might, his reason, his memory, whatever, whatever ones it might be. Um, and here, he's, here Schumann is saying essentially the same thing, that life can't be pinpointed in any sort of way that um, we, we can comprehensibly reduce it to this or that thing, right? It's... Um, it's it, 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 it a whole works in dynamic with its parts right that dynamic in itself is somewhat in excess of the whole if you understand what i mean is in the excess of all the parts puts it together in a way that is unified um, and can't be reduced it's a, it's a beautiful thing now does philosophy have a place in this debate spayman states that philosophy along with the philosopher with no specialized knowledge in the specific field of neurology, let's say, of course can't weigh in on the particulars of the empirical science, but he, she is certainly qualified to weigh in on whatever theoretical interpretations result. This, by the way, is always an important thing to be aware of, and these are my two cents, um, if you or a family member find yourself in hospital. Reason is anyone's territory, and a doctor as much as a patient has the right to weigh in on what constitutes life, death, etc. Philosophy is anyone's game, but usually the person with the most practice <laughs> gets it right, typically. Um, Speyman, for instance, um, is an authority because he's always been studying this stuff for onward of 50 years. Now, I, having worked in a hospital, um, I can say that there are a lot of doctors who have a deep ethical um, understanding and have studied this stuff, but then are some, <laughs> there are some who are just like, you know, when it comes to this stuff, they might be brilliant surgeons, but are just doorknobs. They they don't know, they don't know a thing. They have no bedside manner. They have no uh, real understanding of a human other than a, the robot he comes to see every day and fix. Um, and I'd say the one is startling. It's just as startling uh, as the other. You don't expect a doctor to be well-read philosopher who can draw on Aristotle, just as you'd hope you don't expect uh, the ones who who treat you like machinery. Um, often there isn't a middle ground. They're either one or the other. And I think uh, doctors probably take up two very distinct personality types um, in that way. So a, a good illustration of this, Spayman seems to infer, is that when Schumann's interpretations were put forth at a conference, the defenders of brain death didn't argue Schumann's research, but instead took the argument into the arena of what does or doesn't constitute consciousness. So this is kind of like the example we talked about before with the two subgroups. Um, so I guess maybe that one wasn't a conference. This is the conference that Spayman was at. And there people um, took up the position of... Um, So they didn't argue Schumann's research. It all seemed right. It all seemed true. It all seemed to breathe air. But 
but they took up the argument. So when they kind of realized and conceded to that, um, they took up instead um, what does or doesn't constitute consciousness. So they moved it away from the integral integral unity argument. This is the second subgroup, I should say. I think that's that's the point here. Um, and they took it more into the position of what constitutes consciousness. So they got into mind-body relations just like we did last week. Um, so Spayman then challenges the Catholic philosopher Edward J. Furton, who disputes Schumann by taking the same position, more or less, as Peter Singer, oddly enough, that human life and the human person are two separate things. Spayman argues that this is not, contrary to the Catholic position Furton claims to hold, the church's actual position. And I haven't written them down here, but, you know, the church will often, um, you know, the, the, the priests are, aren't necessarily neurologists in there knowing, doing all the empirical science. So as far as the church or any bodies that, that take up philosophy seriously, uh, as far as they can go is to take that theoretical interpretation that is gotten from empirical data and make a philosophical inter uh, their own philosophical understanding of it, and and while um, it was asserted that brain death was uh, the dis dis in disintegration in the unity of life, while science was holding that argument for however many decades, the church agreed. There's like okay, well if that is the case, then we can say that brain death is in some in in some way the death of the person and so that they could sanction this idea of uh, um, this understanding of death but Spayman argues that well now the research has changed so it's kind of silly that Edward J. Furton isn't looking at this new data Schumann's in particular that talks about um, this more dynamic system that can't be atomized to a single part like the brain to explain its function so for the church, the human soul, in other words, the whole entirety of the person, is one. The anima intellecta, intellectiva, intellectual soul, is at the same time the forma corporis, the body's form. Um, so let's go into what that means. Okay, so the ancient understanding of the soul. So now Speyman takes a, a sort of turn into to, to argue Furton's point um, that persons uh, Furton's point being that persons and human life aren't identical they're not the same thing human life when it is robbed of certain processes ceases to become personal life now Spayman is taking up the classical argument of of the of the intellectual soul, the way that we've always understood who, what the human being was. And to get into this argument, I am just going to briefly take you through the classical understanding of the soul. So there was a vegetative soul, there was a sensitive soul, and there was a rational soul. Otherwise, we could call it vegetative soul, an animal soul, and an intellectual soul, or a spiritual soul. So these are the sort of three stratas of soulship, you could say. So vegetables have a soul of, 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 well, looking at the second point there, veg vegetables um, and plants have that sort of vegetative soul concerning basic growth in an organism. Um, animal or sensitive soul, this concerns the basic appetites of sex, food, and sleep. And the spiritual, the rational soul, this concerns reflection, intention, we could say, creativity, morality, value perception, e.g. the good, the true, the beautiful, etc. Now, while animals pass through a vegetative state, and humans pass through both vegetative and animal stages, this does not mean animals and humans have multiple souls, let's say. In the case of the human, his or her soul, once reaching the spiritual stage of its development, takes over the functions of simultaneously fulfilling the vegetative and sensory motor functions. Um, so basically when, um, you know, 
I am not a vegetable, an animal, and then a spiritual soul. And there aren't these like sort of three layered cake. I'm not like a layered cake of soulness um, inside myself, but rather I pass through these stages in and the vegetative soul, when I pass in from the vegetative soul into the animal soul, that vegetative soul is taken up into the animal soul. So it's integrated into it. So it can't be, it can't be divided now. And likewise, once I one, one reaches that spiritual soul, then the other two have t been taken up into the spiritual soul. So in this way, it kind of confounds those arguments when someone says, you know, of a dementia patient when they, when they hug some, someone in late stage dementia, people will often say, you know, well, it's just their lizard brain functioning now when they do some sort of what seems like a reflexive activity, like hugging somebody or recognizing somebody or or you know those amazing abilities that they have to play the piano still even though they've forgotten everything um, or to pray the liturgy etc um, a lot of the times people reduce this to some lizard brain reflex but that would be to say that you and your lizard brain are two that, that you are a layered cake that you just sort of drift off piecemeal until you're back to this sort of basic um, basic soul again um, and, and, and not that full spiritual soul that you've entirely become. So that's, that's the classical argument. So in this sense, a human person is always a spiritual, rational soul, even when intellectual processes appear absent. Just as the penis nonetheless re remains a penis, even while away from a piano, the soul of the human being is an anima intellectiva, even when it is factually unable to think. The being of man is not thinking, but living. Right, so, so it was never the case for the um, for the ancients who claimed humans were formed by an intellectual soul um, that this meant you had to have what we sort of reduce today as intellect, some sort of calculator in your head, some reasoning function. It means that this is just the 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 spiritual soul that forms the human person that unifies it. The, the body itself is an expression of this intellective soul. So all you have to be is living to be considered a human person, right? It's not like as if there's this intellectual soul part that we lose because it's ultimately what forms you, what unifies you with your body, right? Your soul with your body is this intellectual soul. I mean, I shouldn't even say unifies, I should say the, um, the body is almost a manifestation, or is a manifestation, of that informing, in-forming, um, uh, intellectual soul that we all are. So the ancients would have never reduced a dementia patient or a brain-dead patient to less than their living, breathing, human existence, right? So instead of concluding, writes Spayman, where there is no longer any thinking, the forma corporis, the, 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 the intellectual soul that forms the body of the human being has disappeared, we can only thus conclude, as long as the body of the human being is not dead, the personal soul is also still present. Only the second conclusion is compatible with Catholic doctrine as well as the tradition of European philosophy. Back to Aristotle and Plato. Spayman concludes with three German jurists who state, to sum up, there is no justifiable way uh, to affirm brain death as actual death. It exists as a determinant point for physicians where loss of brain functions seem irreversible and death therefore imminent where the physician's duty of treatment comes to an end. So brain death can be justified in where our responsibilities may or may not come to an end. Okay. So it's, it's a legitimate term, and we can keep the term, um, these German ju arguments. Ju German jurists are saying, and Sp Spayman is agreeing. But of course, we can't um, go so far as to say that life is gone, that the person has ceased, that Bob isn't still experiencing himself as Bob, right? We have no confirmation of that. We have no understanding of that. We don't know that. Um, so when in doubt, 
favor life. It's still there. So that's uh, that, I believe.